All right. Hi. I just see more people joining, dropping in. Thank you very much for joining this webinar on this Friday. We're already, I think, really good in time. There's more people coming, so we'll just wait a little bit longer until before we introduce everybody, um, also showcase what we're going to do and have a really good webinar I'm really excited about. All right. Um, a very, very warm welcome to this uh, webinar from the Coffee Roasters Guild and the Specialty Coffee Association. My name is Richard Stiller. I work for the Specialty Coffee Association since five years, and I'm also the Guilds Director, and I'm very happy that um, I'm joined here today also by David from the Coffee Roaster Guild and the leadership who will introduce our panelists and also the webinar a little bit later. Before we start, I just wanted to do um, or give a huge shout out and thank you to Saver Brands, who is sponsoring and supporting this webinar today. And before we jump into the webinar, they also have a very short video, cool made video, we're going to watch. It's uh, one minute. Please enjoy. Thank you very much. It's, it's, it's tough. It's been tough. It's been difficult. We've over sugarcoated. Our coffee shop has closed down. Oh, it's definitely hitting us hard. Um, you know, we're taking it day by day and just trying to stay positive and evolve as quickly as we quickly as we can. How do we create a scenario where we don't have to lay a single employee off? We we often also run in in the comfort zone, and in the comfort zone, magic does not happen. We have a live chat. And then people get online, get on the site, and as soon as they're asking a question, super quick to respond. We did like a 24-hour uh, delivery. We walked by this vacant drive-through um, and, and called the phone number that was outside and ultimately, ultimately called four or five more people and everyone said yes. We want to help people get brewing. We want to tell you how what coffee you should get. So we're all helping each other out. We're supporting other local businesses. Other local businesses are supporting us. So thank you very much, Saver Brands, for supporting the Specialty Coffee Station and the Coffee Roasters Guild. And I'm very happy that I'm able to hand over the virtual microphone and yeah, in this direction to David. David, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I'm David Myers. I'm from the uh, Coffee Roasters Guild uh, leadership team. And uh, I have the pleasure of working with a couple of great people over at North Central College, Matthew Crystal and Gerald Thalman. I'll give them a quick introduction. Um, Matthew has been studying and working in the Keat J. Maya community for uh, more than two decades, starting with Fulbright Grant to conduct field research for his PhD in sociocultural anthropology from Tulane University. And since 2005, he's been the faculty advisor and cultural consultant to the North Central College, an actress direct trade project for coffee, chocolate, and crafts. And uh, Jerry has an MBA from University of Wisconsin-Whitewater, and prior to joining the academia ranks, he worked in the nonprofit se sector, and his work with the Peace Corps influenced his work with farmers who have limited access to U.S. markets. And he's uh, been advising the Enactus Project at North Central College since 2000, and in 2004, began working with the Direct Trade Project. And uh, the fun thing about all this is that the issues and the content from the projects they've been working on uh, in Guatemala for the past 15 years have been integrated into their undergraduate student learning. And twice each year, they travel to the community in Guatemala to uh, introduce students to the ongoing projects that they've been working on. And I'm really delighted to uh, be working with them and uh, have a chance to introduce their project and. Uh, these these two great guys to the coffee community today. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it over and enjoy. Thank you all for showing up. Thank you, uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you, David, uh, for organizing this. Thanks to the Roasters Guild as well. This is Matt Crystal, and um, we have we're gonna start with our original title. It's a bit long to fit into uh, and another material we wanted to use to promote the webinar. But the original title was Relationships, Relationship Coffee and Relationality, 15 Years of Collaboration with the Indigenous Coffee Farmers of Cafe Juanana. Um, we, um, we, this, I think, I, I, you know, we're giving you this original title here because it breaks it into the three sections we're going to talk about today, uh, three topics. First, the history of the North Central College Coffee Program, 
uh, through relationships. Um, this idea of relationship coffee that we recently came across and how it intersects with our approach to direct trade and our, and, and in our approach in general. And then third, um, relationality, this uh, last of those three uh, terms with the relationship built into it somehow or another in the worldview of the Kachi Kelmaya uh, farmers that we work with. And I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry, who's gonna tell us a little bit about how this whole, the whole project got started. Okay, first of all, I also wanna thank David and Richard and the Roasters Guild for sponsoring this and really appreciate it. And, and what we're gonna do again is we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of our, our project. It started 15 years ago. And when originally started our, um, uh, another colleague who was working with us, Jean Clifton, who um, is Emeritus Professor of Human Resources, um, she reminded us that it was all about relationships. This is more than just a business project, but it's a project that we, that's all encompassing. Some of those relationships were very intentional. Some of them were just natural and, and went on by the way. So what I wanna do is give a, 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 an outline of where we have been and where we're at today. Um, first of all, the project started in 2004, kind of, kind of by accident um, in a, uh, a uh, coffee break after church one day, uh, there was um, a lady, Marianne was selling coffee and uh, that she had imported from Guatemala and, or she had brought back because she had gone to the mission down there and, and she was real excited about it. And I thought, you know, our, our project was already dealing with social issues along with business. So I thought, you know, maybe we can take this back as a fundraiser. I took it back to the students and they were totally excited. We started selling the coffee as it was from Guatemala in 2004, raising money um, for that. Um, one of the things that was happening though, also in 2004, that was shortly after the commodity prices had hit an all time low in recent history. And so therefore the students said, you know what, we need to make sure that the farmers are being treated appropriately. And they said, let's go and visit them. Let's make sure that they're following fair trade practices and, and, and um, so that we can make sure that they that this is completely legitimate and it says great let's do it we didn't have any funding so what we did is we went and wrote a grant and to gene and my surprise somewhat we won the grant and we got this to take six faculty and students to guatemala and the problem we had though is neither gene nor i had very much knowledge we had very limited knowledge on guatemala and not very good spanish skills besides and so I was talking to another faculty member and she says, wait a minute here, we've got an expert on Guatemala right in another building who had uh, recently come to campus and that was Matt Crystal. Uh, so in 2004, I went and met him at his office and said, are you interested? He immediately said yes. And we've been working together ever since. Our first trip to uh, San Lucas then was in 2005 and we bought the coffee as it was from San Lucas Toleman in Guatemala for two years and uh, sold it as a fundraiser. And um, in 2007, somebody else from my church who owned a coffee shop said she wanted to meet with me. And we were excited that we thought we could sell more of our coffee there. And, and we got together at her coffee shop and I said, whoa, wait a minute here. I'm not sure what's going on. And she says, we want to roast your coffee for you. We want to have really fresh, high quality coffee. And so he says, oh, then let's try it. So in 2007, we started getting our roast, our coffee roasted locally. Uh, we outsourced it at three different places over the years. And then about um, uh, five years ago, in one of my classes, they did a capital budgeting project and said, wait a minute here, we could roast it on campus and we could get a lot more out of it. So in 2019, in May last year, we uh, got our own coffee roaster on campus. It's a, a 12 kilo probat uh, roaster. And since May, we've been roasting it. And uh, since also since we began, we've been uh, going to Guatemala and visiting those farmers at least twice a year. Unfortunately, this summer will be one time. We're probably gonna have to do it remotely. We're gonna be doing it by video, but we still won't miss that opportunity. So um, Matt's gonna tell you, um, about San, uh, San Lucas and um, go from here. Yeah, so, you know, uh, when Jerry came in and asked if, if I'd be interested in getting involved in this project, he, you know, as he said, I, I, he didn't even have to get the full sentence out of his mouth before I said yes. Uh, as he mentioned, I'd been doing field work 
there before. And if you know anything about Highland Guatemala, it's a great place. It's a very, very interesting place for, for folks interested in linguistic diversity, ecological diversity, cultural diversity, and so forth. So yeah, that immediately I said yes. And um, so San Lucas is a Cachicel Maya community. It's on the southeast uh, corner of Lake Atitlan. If you can picture that bay that goes back in there, if you know that region at all, it's at the base of that bay back there. About 15,000 people live in, the, in a densely packed town center. And that's what the picture shows here. And then on the skirts of the volcanoes surrounding the community is where the coffee farmers and a number of rural communities are. Um, so that's San Lucas. And as we mentioned, we're gonna we're gonna sort of uh, as and as Jerry uh, talked about it, we're looking at this how this project developed through relationships. And the first person that we have to mention in, in that sense is is Father Greg Schaefer. Um, he really did have a, a a way of connecting to people in a way that made you feel like you had a special connection to him. And I remember thinking I have a special connection to him. He's very interested in anthropology and. Uh, and, and so forth. But then as I talked to other people, I realized that he had special connections with an awful lot of people. Uh, so he was really, really gifted in relationships. Uh, what appealed to me as an anthropologist and what made me really excited about being involved in the project uh, is this idea that he, he used to say that people have a right to live their culture as they see fit, kind of anticipating what would become a cornerstone of the, um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. He also would tell stories about relationships he uh, in in relating to people in the community, and and one of the early ones, as I remember it, uh, involved a project that he created uh, to serve hot breakfasts to people uh, in the community, and he was he came up with the idea and then and organized it and delivered the breakfasts, and was very happy with the work. People seemed happy with the food they were getting. Uh, and then someone from the community or some leaders from the community came and said, Father, this is really wonderful what you've done here, uh, but don't you think it would be better if you helped us get some land so we could grow our own food? And he told, he told that story as a way to make sure that we understood that the projects in the community weren't purely a result of his efforts, that they were a lot about listening to the needs of the community and responding to them. Um, and that is the basis for which he founded, on which he founded this uh, growers association, Cafe Juanana, uh, that began in 1992. Uh, the next person that we began to talk to early in the development of our program here was Julio Morales. Uh, he was then the president of the growers association. Um, and it, the students had a, sometimes had a hard time understanding just how excited and proud he was of his work because he always referred to it uh, in the plural. And it's never about Julio, it was always we, uh, and he talked about the, the, the program. We thought on our end, as Jerry kind of hinted, uh, we would be arriving there with uh, some skills and filling out forms and paperwork and applying for grants and so forth, uh, that we would help the Growers Association achieve a fair trade uh, membership or a fair trade status. Uh, Julio very politely declined us. Uh, he knew a bit more about fair trade than we expected. Uh, they'd already explored it and they had really identified their problem was with having too many intermediaries between the small plot farmer uh, and the coffee consumer. And we responded to that and really focused on developing a, a program where there was a lot of face-to-face -face and direct work with the farmers with that goal of, of access to the market, uh, eliminating as many of those intermediaries uh, as possible. And you can see a couple of the the labels of the Growers Association it recently changed its name to Cafe Juanana, uh, um, and there, you can see their labels there. And I'll turn it back to Jerry to talk about what what came out of those early meetings and relationships. Okay, one of the, one of the things that we um, again, as Matt kind of alluded to, that we we thought we were uh, we understood what was going on, and and one of my experiences that I'm gonna that why I even brought the Peace Corps part in here is that. Sometimes from a distance, uh, we can answer problems or uh, make decisions that are totally inappropriate. And one of the issues or the way that we can do that uh, to make decisions that are appropriate is with our face-to-face uh, -face engagement. And we found that, um, again, back in our campus in, in Naperville, Illinois, we knew that what they should do is they should be fair trade. Um, Talking with Julio, we found out maybe we're not quite so right. And mm -hmm. so therefore, um, by making this direct trade model, we were requiring that we 
met with them regularly and they met with us uh, and we exchanged ideas. And their, their main issue again was main, minimizing the intermediaries. And also we put it back to the business concepts and we says, okay, wait a minute, this is not really fair trade that we're doing. We're really doing more free trade, but yet um, we're doing it differently. And so we came up with the concept that our project is fairer than fair trade, but freer than free trade. And we try to keep with that model as much as we can. And going back to you, Matt. Yeah, and so uh, in that, that's a period in the timeline here where we uh, began uh, after that to um, initially importing roasted coffee and shifting to green bean coffee and began that pro uh, the process or the schedule of two visits a year. And there's one of our early trips there. You see the groups get bigger and uh, the project and the, uh, the visits get more complicated and so forth uh, until um, we, uh, this other sort of relationship begins to develop, right? From the initial foundations of the res those relationships to the, this idea of relationship coffee and the critical relationship that begins to be established between faculty and administration here. And Jerry, I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about that. Again, a little bit of, uh, this is a little bit like what we did when we got our grant and I went and met Matt Crystal. Matt, is that in uh, a number of, a few years ago, we decided that it's time that we bring a coffee roaster, buy one and, and get one on campus. And and once again, we, we went back and rather than starting from scratch, we went and tried to look at what relationships we have, how can we make this work um, uh, more effectively? And, and on our uh, board of uh, trustees, we have uh, a member who is an alumni from North Central who owned his own coffee shop and was an executive at Starbucks. I said, whoa, wait a minute. How can, how can we do any, um, how can we move forward without meeting with him? So I asked for an introduction to, uh, to Jim McDermott. And at the time, again, he was on our academic uh, division of the board, which also was looking at high impact practices. And I thought, whoa, wait a minute here. We don't have to go outside. We have all of these great resources within the school. And so therefore we went back and we looked at the relationships and we started working with him. One of the things we find with relationships, sometimes it would be, I'm not saying this about Jim, but sometimes it'd be faster for us to just do it on our own. But with relationships, we're doing it right. We're doing, uh, we, have, we have confidence that we're gonna be successful in uh, where we're going with them. And so um, after we met with uh, Jim McDermott and a and, uh, couple times, I think one of Ted, Ted's Montana Grill and another day in our, our coffee shop. And, and we went from us thinking that we could get um, a, a used roaster and put it in somebody's basement or garage to where we now have our, our full scale coffee lab. And for Jim to get more um, understanding of our project as well. We needed to also link that relationship with the, the Farmers Association. And Eddie, who is, who is a head of the Farmers Association, is in the middle here. And Carlos is their roaster. And then Jim and our first um, uh, graduate student manager is on the far, uh, far left and myself. Okay, Matt? Gonna... Yeah. Well, I, I would say uh, too in this, right? Uh, my first conversation with Jim was about curriculum and high impact learning. It wasn't about coffee. So there, there really, really was we, you know, our involvement in working with these farmers and uh, over the years um, and kind of knowing coffee just on our own terms, right? Very, in a very close way to close to our own work was complemented by his much broader understanding of, uh, of the coffee supply, the whole coffee market, uh, the coffee globally. Um, but the first conversation I had with him was about high impact learning. So that I thought that was, it really were complementing interests. And out of those relationships and his knowledge, Jim's knowledge of the coffee industry, um, you know, our original proposal was to take a loan and buy a coffee, used coffee roaster we could pay off. And Jim sort of said, well, why don't we get a new one? And of course, Jim knew that Probat had its North American or has its North American manufacturing not far at all from our campus in suburban Chicago. Uh, so we, uh, a new relationship built was built there between the college and between Probat. And this really completed the student experience, right? We can really say our students um, have hands-on learning from seedling to cup, 
Uh, and in the past, before this lab was established, uh, it was where, where we had a lot of intensive interactions between the students, among the students and between students and faculty was either uh, on the trips to Guatemala or at sales events. And now that we have this space where, where the students are doing the roasting, packaging the coffee, um, we, it, it really allows for there to be a lot more of those relationships on campus. And um, we recently took a look at some research on um, what employers are looking for in college graduates. And uh, there's an, uh, a study out there that aggregates a number of other studies. And we looked down the list of these, of the soft skills in particular, uh, and found, boy, you know, if a student travels with us and a student gets involved and works in the lab, they tick off almost every one of the, uh, the skills that, or they, they can develop all the skills that employers uh, say they're looking for. Uh, it's also meant that um, wider student involvement. So a chemistry student who maybe isn't interested in traveling to Guatemala can uh, get do work on testing water quality at the lab and testing the, um, the chemistry of, uh, of, of, uh, of the roasted coffee and so forth. So there's a lot of interdisciplinary cooperation. And as we say, right, this sort of completed the chain here. We have uh, student involvement every, every step of the way with the lab. We have some photos here, just open last May. So we're looking at like a year it's been open. Uh, some students there. There's Jerry there with some other students. And, and so, what, uh, um, so what emerges here is this idea of um, relationship coffee. And uh, this, we learned of this term relationship coffee. We're going to credit David with this. We were, as we were having conversations about uh, the real space live event, we were going to do uh, a, a roasters uh, summit that we were going to have and had to postpone because of, uh, of COVID-19. Uh, uh, David mentioned this idea of relationship coffee and we're like, okay, well, what's that? So we went and looked it up and we found this definition here in this article published in Business and Strategy or Business Strategy in the Environment. And it focuses on um, uh, especially, uh, you know, a coffee chain arrangement that emphasizes quality, close relationships between uh, roaster, importer and coffee farmers and um, as we read this definition, we realized this is a lot of what we're doing. What might be distinctive about our approach is how much the students are involved in it uh, from beginning to end. And so to illustrate a little bit of that, uh, uh, that um, relationships between students or, or between um, uh, folks in, along the supply chain here, we have Michael Dewey with the, the, the visor on there. And he's the current roaster for us, a student who just graduated and is continuing in our, in our MBA program next year. Uh, next to Carlos the Roaster. That picture was not taken in our lab. That was taken in San Lucas, our last trip there. A couple trips ago is Toribio. Toribio is a senior member of the Growers Association. He's explained to us a little bit about Maya spirituality and an altar he has on his property. And there's Marguerite and uh, Kim, again with Carlos, who also is the, the barista for uh, Cafe Juanana. And they're looking at a Chemex and Carlos explaining how to do a good Chemex there. And here, Hydro explains to us a little bit about, um, or describes a, a sort of involved process uh, in maintaining a, a coffee agroforestry plot uh, over the year. Uh, they have a demonstrator plot there for visitors. And here we are with our students learning about all the work that's involved in coffee agroforestry. And again, here's Carlos showing us roast profiles uh, using their sample roaster there. That was a, from a few years ago, that trip there. And we have pictures here of our uh, students from this year in particular. So I'm going to let Jerry here tell us a little bit, uh, I conclude this, wrap this uh, part of the section up here uh, with this relationship coffee model that we have developed. Okay, I, I, I'm going to talk about the, each of the different areas though, even though go, going back to the last photo a little bit, one of the things that we've found with the relationship and the and um, is students are interested in coffee and what we found is that um, we don't have to stretch their imagination we don't have to go in and say please get involved with this project they're involved they're interested in coffee from a number of perspectives and and I think that makes this um, a lot easier to get the relationship with the students together and and some of the students 
are, are coming to us because they like to make lattes or they like not make them but drink lattes or they they um, some of them come to us because they, they they just like a good cup of coffee some of them are coming to us because they are um, very aware of of uh, the uh, uh, conditions in which many of the coffee farmers are living and and they're very aware of of um, the coffee industry and, and very interested in getting more involved in it that way. And then there's a third group that are just interested in, in business practices. And we have our own business on campus. So we've got three distinct groups of, of not distinct, I guess they're, they're overlapping, but three groups of students that are very interested in doing the project. One of the, so one of the nice things for us is that we don't have to recruit as hard as what we would if it were a less interesting uh, concept. So therefore, coffee is of interest to this generation for sure and and yeah. we appreciate that it makes our life easier as well okay yeah, now yeah no that's fine that's the quote too right from uh the slide on faculty uh, administration relationships developing a uh, uh, jim likes to say uh coffee uh builds relationships coffee brings people together and it, it absolutely does mm -hmm. and even even um when we talk about our lab a little bit it, it brought students together even a little bit like the historical coffee shops did and and um so we have a gathering of students in a way that we've never been able to accomplish in the last uh 20 years that i've been involved in an actus and and so it's pretty cool so anyhow the the part i want to talk about is that that uh with our our approach we do um everybody benefits from this and i want to talk a little bit about each of these uh different groups and and Again, one of the things that our students, one of the first things that they benefit from it is that um, the textbooks don't always have everything in them. We're learning things and they're learning things about suppliers that quite often, especially accounting textbooks, kind of ignore the suppliers. We're getting those experiences. And so from a, a student's perspective, there's a couple of other directions that I think are really significant in this project. First of all, some of our students have um, their only experiences of traveling outside of the U.S. are to resorts or on, on cruises and maybe not cruises anymore, but uh, cruise ships and to Mexican resorts. And, and they're not familiar with, with actually meeting with um, the real citizens of these countries. And, and um, sometimes it's a shock and, and the cultural differences are significant, significant. Part of them, even for our students, though, is that many of our students are used to Chicago, a, a huge city, and then we're going to a small community. And even that, that I guess they could probably get a little bit here in the States that they're not familiar with. And then there's a second group of students that I think that sometimes we forget when we talk about this, and they are the ones who are um, uh, students who've grown up around Spanish and Spanish was their first language. They've spoken it in their home. They've used it for casual, used it for personal reasons, but they've never used it for a business, for business purposes. And so they're the translators for us. Matt is very good at, I mean, Matt's uh, excellent in Spanish. I have none, so they, I have to depend on them a lot. And it, it, it's a good experience for them that they, they can see how their, uh, their language they grew up, grew up with is actually valuable to them. The farmers, um, again, one of the things that we, that we knew, but the only way you could see it is by going there is that they know farming they know coffee we don't know how to how to uh grow coffee or or mm -hmm. or even they know better with fertilizers even or organic or not but what they don't have is they don't have access to the u.s markets and that we can help them with and we have been helping them with and we've got a ways to go but we would like to do more of it third is is institutional differentiation there are not many coffee programs in uh the u.s there are uh, a couple of other coffee roasters on campus where they've got projects around them, but but this really gives us an opportunity for the institutional differentiation. We have the whole coffee roasting program from uh, or the whole program from start to finish, also taking an entrepreneurial and cultural perspective rather than scientific. No other small school has this, and um, our, our competition it, it really makes us differentiated. Uh, next, with teaching materials, um, I use uh, the uh, um, project in my accounting classes all the time. 
And in fact, sometimes you, it may be a, a difficult to see whether my class is a, an accounting class or a coffee class. And because we, we can use the examples in here, there's, we can deal with, with variances and quality control and, and um, all of the different uh, budgeting perspectives in here. Um, we also in business don't do a lot of field work or have a lot of field work opportunities. We have internships, but this is a little bit different than that. We're actually seeing the supplier. The field work opportunities actually is, is uh, a great benefit to the anthropology and uh, math's work and, and, and that's a requirement of their students. So we believe that there's benefits to everybody and we all learn from this. And, and Matt's gonna, before I pass it on to you, Matt, uh, one of the other things is, is that these benefits though didn't just happen. Um, the first year we were there, yeah, we wanted to do some of these things, but we couldn't really do them because we needed to have that relationship. That had to be formed before the farmers really had, um, had trust in us. We had to build that trust. And so that's partly why this 15 years of the uh, of the um, project are so important. It isn't that it just started last year, because if it was, we can we again we can solve all the world's problems from afar. Um, this was based on the relationship. The field work opportunities he's going to talk about were based on on the relationships that we've developed with the farmers and with the other people that we've worked with. So uh, we think that everybody benefits. We we know they do, Matt. Absolutely, yeah, and and everyone learns too, and um, that's what that's what ethnography or ethnographic fieldwork is is about. It's about learning of the way of life of an, of another people, uh, and for anthropology students, right? It's 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 fundamental in our training for for undergraduates, uh, more so for graduate students. This has really given us a great opportunity to do some some fun, uh, interesting uh, fieldwork, uh, and what we've tried to do here, as Jerry was getting at. Uh, is to use an approach uh, that Luke Eric Lasseter, an ethnographer of, uh, of the Great Plains in the United States, calls collaborative ethnography. And the idea of collaborative ethnography is um, that from the, from the onset, right, the, the, the research project is one uh, that has input from the subjects of the study as well as from the ethnographers and, uh, and tries to generate uh, products that are useful to the community. And that's what we're gonna take a look at here and, and talk a little bit about what we've learned in that process. So we're going to use this concept of relationality because it fits well in the title of relationship coffee. Now we'll talk a little bit about it because it's something we've learned uh, in making some ethnographic documentary films uh, that have focused on spirituality and an economy uh, in the communities we work in. Uh, we'll start by um, with the concept here and then we're going to hear from uh, a Maya spiritualist, a Maya a religious practitioner, and then from some coffee farmers. So uh, Eileen Morton Robinson, who is an indigenous person and scholar, uh, a world-renowned um, respected scholar uh, in indigenous studies, uh, defines relationality uh, as in terms of experiencing self as part of others and others are part of the self. And it's learned through reciprocity, obligation, shared experiences, coexistence, uh, cooperation, and social memory. When I talk to my students about this, I like uh, to emphasize how this is a, a different way of thinking about personhood, right? Uh, it's a way of thinking about personhood that's different from the North American way that stresses the individual and the individual as a self-authoring particulate entity and, and shifts the focus into the web of relationships among individuals. Uh, and, and so that individual is conceived of in, as in relationship to others. And the, we chose the picture here because Jerry and I were both here when our volunteer photographer, Jerry's nephew, Brad Tallman, uh, took this picture. Uh, the interview was with the man on the right. He's the you know, sort of the representative of the family to the Growers Association. But when we went down this, to take the portrait, he said, well, no, everybody in the family works in this and we need to have the family in the picture. And that's a common experience we've had in, uh, in talking to folks and working with them uh, is uh, they wanna have in that picture and in that discussion, the people that they work with and the members of their family. So how does this idea of relationality, how is it expressed in Kakchikel culture? And we're gonna let uh, Edgar, Edgar is uh, nephew to two of the senior members of the Growers Association. As I mentioned, 
He is a religious practitioner. The term in Kakshi Kel for it is Ich, and it means keeper of the days. So it's often our keeper of the uh, of the calendar and often translated simply as daykeeper. But let's hear what he has to say about this idea and how relationship re, re, relationality uh, is expressed in Kakshi Kel culture. Ya no es eso que ya no hay que hablar mucho que esto es mío. Tenemos que hablar que todo es nuestro. Y por eso para la ética cosmogónica es más importante el nosotros que el yo o el tú. Está clarísimo. ¿sí? Y por eso nosotros eh, en, en Gaxiquel tenemos un término del Huachalal. Huachalal a veces dicen que es eh, hermanos. Pero el Huachalal así en, 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 en el fondo filosófico es yo soy tú y tú eres yo. Entonces por lo tanto no te puedo hacer daño. Entonces si te hago daño me estoy haciendo daño. Entonces, estas palabras no surgieron de la nada, tienen un fondo filosófico y nosotros lo manejamos mucho. Guacharal, todos son mis guacharal, mi guacharal es la piedra, mi guacharal es el árbol, todos son mis guacharal. Luego antes yo de cortar un árbol, yo tengo que pedirle perdón, que por algo lo voy a votar, no porque se me ocurre. Entonces, porque si se votan los árboles solo por así, también tiene sus consecuencias. Y, y son consecuencias, ahora le llamamos ambientales, ¿verdad? Pero no es más que nos estamos asfixiándonos, solos. So, so Edgar expresses this wachalal as this idea, uh, very similar to the, the, the idea of relationality we saw in the previous slide, and not just uh, relationships between people, but between uh, people and nature. So the next one is Hortensia, and Hortensia uh, talks Hear a little bit about the three next speakers are all coffee farmers and um, we asked them to as we did these interviews we asked them to tell us something about how they got involved in coffee tell us something about your day-to-day -day life in coffee uh, tell us something about your hopes for the future in coffee and in terms of day-to-day -day life you know what is it what does coffee mean what how is it important in your life and we didn't ask them to talk about their families but they often do and we're, let's take a look at what Hortensia has to say here Muchas gracias a ustedes que vienen a ver el café y se los compren. Entonces, muchísimas gracias a ustedes. Eh, ustedes saben que nosotros aquí tenemos hijos y los papás quieren pisos, quieren muchas cosas y nosotros no podemos dar, pero con la ayuda pues que allá no están, nosotros eh, juntamos un poco el dinero y nosotros estamos muy agradecidos con ustedes. So for Hortensia, what coffee means is the ability to engage in, in gift giving and reciprocity with their children. Oops, wrong button. Next, the next farmer is Abel, uh, and he has, has that similar sort of relationship, but remembering um, his father. Mi señor padre siempre tuvo la ilusión de ver a sus hijos con un carrito, con una bicicleta, con una moto. Gracias a Dios ya aún mi hermano ya tiene su carrito, ¿verdad? Es producto del café. So, so from the perspective of the child to the parent and what coffee means here. Trying to advance the slide. There we go. Next one is Hydro. We saw Hydro in one of the slides earlier. Uh, he connects the generations in his discourse here. Que que yo pueda algún día ver a mi hijo graduarse de de la universidad porque es mi deseo. Porque nosotros también tuvimos dificultad con nuestros padres porque no no no, 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 no tenían un buen salario, no nos dieron lo que, lo que nosotros tal vez ahorita podemos darle o brindarle a nuestros hijos. Entonces yo algún día mi deseo es ver a mi hijo crecer, ver a mi hijo graduarse y que él sea de un, un hombre de bien y todo. So Jairo, remembering his, his parents, 
his relationship with his children and, and a vision for the future for his son. All right, sorry about that. And then the next two are frame coffee and the relationship between coffee and the coffee farmer. Así, cuando tenemos un buen desarrollo del café, podemos, son también te, podemos eh, tener un buen ingreso de café. Y eso nos ayuda a que nosotros podemos desenvolvernos. ¿no? So Angelica takes care of her coffee and her coffee takes care of her and helps her improve her livelihood. And last is Andres. Andres is one of the founding members of the Growers Association, he's one of the senior members. Uh, and he's gonna talk about a uh, relationship between people and coffee, but among the plants also within the coffee plot. Yo estoy preocupado por la, el cambio climático, ¿verdad? Tenemos que sembrar árboles y el café Es una parte de eso. El café es árbol. El café tiene hojas verdes. Y el café tiene que tener sombra para sobrevivir. Y eso nos ayuda. Nos da trabajo, nos da salud, nos da dinero. Y es una ayuda para el mundo. ¿verdad? El café es, para mí, que, para mí que el café no debe desaparecer. ¿verdad? Es, es, es bonito, es bueno. ¿verdad? Of course, the coffee agroforestry plot is an introduced uh, uh, growing technique, but it's similar in important ways to the ways that uh, Highland Maya uh, grow their subsistence uh, of food, uh, their subsistence crop, and that is in the milpa, the corn, bean, and squash intercrop plot. And Mayas often talk about that plot and the way that the plants in it interact and the way that uh, um, Andres talked about it here as, uh, as a symbol for how human community ought to function with each of the plants having its role and working with the others to produce food in the, in the milpa or to produce coffee in the agroforestry plot. And that's, oops, that's what we have for you. Um, we are excited to entertain your questions at this point. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Matt and Jerry. Fantastic, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, for the entire audience, we do have the chat open um, so you should see in the control panel um, chat or, or chat button where you can also type in some questions. Um, nobody has used that function so far. Please do. In the meantime, obviously, um, I do have a question already. <laughs> you talked. Um, I really like that concept of relationships and rationality. Um, you talked about trust before. What would you say that there's differences in that where one needs the other or both are pretty much the same? Um, I'm not sure I understand. Could you could you ask that again? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, why would you call it ration, uh, right, um, relationships coffee and not, for example, trust coffee, right? What, oh, what would okay. you say is, it, if, is yeah. the difference, like the main difference in that concept or Maybe there's some, it's like terminology, but I do feel like there's a strong uh, feel or a strong support for that relationship term, right? And why is that so important? Yeah, I, well, I think it's really important to us in particular, because as I mentioned, right, you know, David um, used the term in conversation as we were talking and we went back and looked at it and and immediately, you know, we thought about what Gene Clifton always said about relationships being the key to it. It's all about the relationships. And it just seemed all along the way, um, building the relationships has been the critical thing and making our project what it is. Uh, so um, yeah, we we embraced it immediately <laughs> as a way for us to to think about what we're doing. Jerry, do you have? I was, I was gonna um, also expand on the trust side. Um, we, uh, every year we go down and we, we do a presentation to the farmers um, and um, for a number of years, I think, you know, that, you know, they listened to us, um, we listened to them, but I don't think that the real relationship 
it was started, but it, I don't think it could be finished until there was that trust. We knew it was there when they started um, more um, questioning and, and being involved in the meetings. I think the first few, they they kind of almost forced some of the leaders, I don't, that's probably pushing a little bit, but almost forced some of the leadership from the coffee association to be there. And, and you know, um, but when they knew that we were gonna come back, they knew that the relationship was was real is when they started trusting. And so they're, they are very uh, connected. connected. Um, and, and I think that here in the States, a lot of what our project is based on the relationship we have with our customers as well. It's, it's not just um, buy a good cup of uh, bag of coffee, but it's also somebody that they can trust and somebody that we've gone back to many times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it, it at this point, when we make our presentation about what we've done with their coffees in the last six months, um, we turn the floor over to the coffee association leadership and they make us a presentation. And it right. really has, uh, when when those sort of those became much more conversations than just us making presentations, I agree with Jerry that that it really that was a a key shift uh, and a movement away from uh, you know folks from a wealthy country trying to do good towards a real partnership. Mm -hmm. um, I did see there's a, a couple of questions already coming in. Um, I think one of the that kind of is a good addition to what we just talked about. Um, what would you say is your biggest learning or also caution of other colleges or universities trying to build similar projects? What would you advise or what is from all these years you've done this? What's your advice on that? Or maybe just probably it's really hard to put it like into one sentence, but is there something you could pick out? Jerry, you have I'll, a thought on I have a thought. I'll start. Yeah, yeah I'll go start. ahead. I, I think that it has to start with um somebody that you have some kind of connection with. Um, I'm not sure this would have worked without Matt's experiences with uh, with the Maya people in, in Guatemala. I'm not sure that, um, and the other thing I guess I would say is to not try to force it too fast um, because again, both back to the relationships and the, and the, uh, and the um, uh, trust is that, uh, why should they trust us? Why should they develop into this relationship? And and we knew that it was actually, we really knew it was successful when they came to us and asked for some help, um, rather than us just telling them what we're doing. What we're doing is irrelevant. What we, do, what we need to do is what they want us to do and what they need for us to do. So I think to not push it, to make it as, as organic as possible, rather than Oh, we're going to go to this country and we're going to make this work. Yeah, and and from my perspective, I think what's what's really critical here, and I'm not just this. I, I thought this before Jerry talked. Uh, you you got to have business faculty and business students involved in it, because if it's going to be sustainable, we there need to be good business practices, and um, you know that. Uh, if it were only social scientists or or, or whoever involved in it, uh, it wouldn't work nearly as well. So the interdisciplinarity uh, with a solid business foundation uh, has, I, to my mind, has been really critical. Yeah, thank you very much. I think there's a follow-up question that makes, um, that's also really interesting, um, talking about also these massive differences, right, between coming from the US and also living um, in Guatemala, right? And there, is the question about like could you emphasize a little bit about how is like how to build relationships when those inequalities are there and if what are strategies or sometimes methods you could use to mm. make it more equal or um, easier to have those relationships on an eye to eye level? Well, that's that well that's that's really a question, isn't it? I I think um, part of what we try to do. Uh, in preparing our students is to have them understand uh, that they're going to experience in a way that our society tends to shield from us uh, just how profound those global inequalities are. Uh, that's part of what Jerry was getting at when saying like this is for some of our students the first time out of the country that would involve going to a resort. Um, and you know I think 
uh, the emphasis on mutual benefit on this is important because uh, but this is part of what we learned from Father Greg, I think, right? If we if we think we're going to save folks and uh, we we bring solutions because of that those inequalities and in the wealth and privilege and and so forth that we enjoy, then that those are models that don't succeed either. It has to be a lot of listening and a lot of mutuality in it. Um, mm -hmm. But that that's you know it. But the reality is, right? Um, we get to go home. We have passports that let us go anywhere we want. We'll see what happens as COVID nineteen continues to to uh, to unfold. If how how welcoming other countries are of American citizens traveling in the future, but you know the the power relation dimension of that is that's fundamentally different. And it I think it's really a great teaching opportunity to have the students uh, experience it directly to dwell on it um, and 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 to try to as we say I think the the important thing is we're not bringing to them something that's going to solve all their problems. What we want to have is an ongoing relationship and a conversation that ends up with coffee farmers making gains in their livelihoods, uh, students learning and, and professors becoming better researchers and having better material to teach their students with. Can I also add that um, as an example of, of the listening is, is I think, a, an important part of it. And, and Matt said that. And I'm not sure you can get that unless you travel. and. What that means is it's a, it's not as many people can go as what we would like. We would love for 200 students to go with us, but that just doesn't work. As an example of it, though, the very first time we were there, we were doing some volunteer work and we were cutting rebar for uh, a building. And students, um, this was our first trip, and we hadn't talked as much about it. But first thing it says, this is crazy. We're using a hacksaw. You know, let's go home and do some fundraising and let's send them an electric or a gas. A um, uh, piece of equipment to cut that rebar. Well, from a from a distance, that sounds good, but one of the things that they have is plenty of labor. And so, what our decisions and our our um, work we have, the field work is is an is a significant part of it, and then listening is the second part of it because um, without without being there, yeah, I can answer all the problems. From 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 my now my kitchen I can't get to school so um, but um, yeah listening and and also the the experiential part mm -hmm. definitely yeah there's also a really good uh, additional question that fits in really well um, talking about um, also the the listening would you say there's or do you can you emphasize on a couple of things that you've seen over the years where the coffee farmers have made progress and changed also their circumstances, right? Through the relationships you, that were established or through the teachings, you were able also to um, have an impact there, right? Like, do you have any, any examples? Well, I, I would hesitate to say that that we alone have had, I, I, don't, I don't know if the, that's implied in the question or not, but I just wanna make clear that, that you know, it, there's a lot of other folks involved in this from, um, uh, the Friends of San Lucas based in the Twin Cities, which is the ecumenical organization that supports the Growers Association, uh, the leadership of the Growers Association, um, the Cafe Livelihood Project that the Catholic Church ran for a while back there. All of, all, there's all sorts of folks that are making contributions here. I think we make a small and significant contribution as, as our project does to a, a much bigger uh, set of of players there, the farm. What the farmers tell us, right, uh, consistently when we do these interviews with them, um, is yeah, that coffee lets them leverage and work towards uh, you know incremental improvements in their livelihoods, and that mm -hmm. they they um, can uh, acquire more land uh, if they're really successful. And one of the farmers we interviewed last summer talked about how over the period of over, over his life, and we asked him, "Tell us about your history in coffee." You know, over a 20 year period of building up uh, larger and larger holding of, of coffee plots and then distributing them to his children uh, so that they could, uh, uh, you know, support themselves as independent farmers as well. That's that's one of the first stories that comes to mind uh, for me in, in what the improvements are. Um, and Jerry, I think um, I'm, I just, I'm sure you have thoughts on that too. I have a couple of them and and, and I agree that that um, we're not going there to, to save them and we're not going there to uh, tell them what to do. It's, um, 
but I think that we help if we can help find a few more uh, get them more access to markets here, then we will have been our our, our most successful. And and we think that well, you know, with talking with them, the 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 association has spent a lot of time on quality improvements, and you know, and, and but they were doing it with a lot of other, um, you know, we help maybe to say our two cents worth, but a lot of other people are involved. The other, and so I, they've really been spending a, quite a bit of time on that. And then the second part is the organic versus the uh, um, uh, non-organic. And, and you know what, they know more about it than we do. And, um, and the, they're the farmers and they're changing or we're excited about it. And maybe our two cents will have helped encourage it a little bit, maybe, maybe not. Um, we still have to remember that probably our greatest value is what we bring back to the people in the US um, in our trips and ourselves um, than what it is to the farmers. And that's, I think, um, uh, again, I think often when we travel to, to communities that are not as wealthy as ourselves. Yeah, I want to follow up there too, guys. The students this year um, worked really hard. We had a great group of students, great leadership, great involvement in the students this year. And we, you know, asking a lot of questions uh, of the Growers Association leadership and reading the literature, they calculated that for every 300 pounds of finished coffee that we sell on our end, uh, means roughly another family can join the Growers Association. And that, that became kind of our benchmark to sort of think and set some goals around that. And that's really what we can do is bring the stories back, as Jerry's saying, bring the stories back uh, in, you know, and a great cup of coffee. It is a really good cup of coffee uh, and encourage more people to buy it. And as we build those relationships with other, with churches, with small grocers in the community and so forth and start selling our coffee in more places, uh, our hope is right that it makes it as it makes its way back each year. It's we, we're buying a bit more green beans from the Growers Association. Yeah, fantastic. I think as a, a final question, just looking at uh, the time, right? Um, I said, there was the question about the the future, right? Where do you see this go? Is there um, also things planned, like for example, somebody from Guatemala coming to the U.S. studying, right? I don't know if that that, that happened or if that is something that could be of interest. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about where you see the program evolve or what this could lead to, right? Yeah, Jerry, you want to go? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we have had discussions about, um, not particularly with the lab as a space and as the project has grown, we had a significant increase in sales this year in no small part because of the lab, um, that that generates more revenue and that gives us more latitude to, to investigate things like how do we create a scholarship that gets uh, a student from Guatemala you know associated with the growers association or with one of our other partner groups uh, to be able to you know be involved in exchange with North Central College so those those are that's a long that's a long process right and and co of course COVID-19 has thrown a lot of of uncertainty into that um, so we do think about about that um, we, um, you know, as we say, we we roughly doubled our sales on coffee this year, and when we get back to a little bit of normalcy, we expect to, to see significant increases uh, moving forward. And that, um, as we say, right, focusing on uh, importing more green bean coffee so the Growers Association can involve more more people in the community and pay them the higher rate that they pay them for the coffee is really what what um, we're focused on. Also, quickly the. Um... Or I'll answer quickly. Uh, one of the other things we want to do is to finish off the relationship part of it. We would love to have a coffee farmer come here uh, to meet with the the our customers. We'd like all of our customers to go with us, but just like we can't take every student, we can't take our all of our customers. So that's another goal is to bring that uh, reciprocity there as well. Yeah, fantastic. I, I think one, just really really quickly one, um, if if there is there's a is there the possibility for smaller roasters maybe also to get involved is that also a possibility and if so yeah. could they just reach out to you directly I guess or yes they can we have a, they can definitely reach out to us and and David uh, will attest that we are really excited about being involved with small roasters uh, that's absolutely part of moving forward too uh, is um, uh, you know being involved in uh, in the specialty coffee um community 
uh, and the lab is a place where, where, where people from small roasters can come and take classes along with our students and David's brainstorming some ideas along those lines. Uh, that's definitely part of, of the future. And we, we would love to be involved uh, in, and we like making partnerships. So if you're from a university and you think this would be good for your students, by all means, reach out for us. We have a lot of ideas about um, um, varying ways uh, 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 that we can collaborate with you. And Richard, if I can, I want to just sort of, here's our thank you slide. And I just wanted to mention specifically, right, uh, how much of a difference the North Central College Coffee Lab has meant. And to thank Jim McDermott for his guidance, uh, his advocacy, and his generosity. We, it, there wouldn't be a lab without without uh, without Jim. And I, I'm hoping that he's in the audience. They, we had a, my sense is that there was a pretty rough board of trustees mem, uh, meeting this last week. And I hope Jim was able to get in for the the, the webinar today. But I wanted to, to say him specifically. And then also, as you see by our, our emblems here, we got a lot of folks to thank uh, that have supported us. Fantastic. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation on relationships relationship coffee thank you very much for all the people who dialed in and listened um also from the specialty coffee station the coffee roasters guild a massive thank you to Sable brands for supporting um thank you for joining thank you very much david for making the connections connecting the dots um, and getting the word out it's always good to share knowledge and share experiences yeah thank you guys very much thank for putting this together of course fantastic thank Thanks you very much and oh yeah, one final thing, a couple of people asked if this is recorded. Yes, this is recorded and you will find the recording um, on the SEA's YouTube channel and we'll post it on the Coffee Roses Guild social media and you'll find that definitely out. Thank you very much for joining. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.